This time into the life of yet another high school student named Kashawagi Asahi. He is woken up by a pet. No, it's a machine. No, what is that thing? Its name is Lovren, and it wakes him up, urging him to hurry up for school. On his way to the train, he starts to wonder why Lovren urged him, despite having so much time to spare. Much like any other start to a show like this, he has a freak accident with another high school beauty who has toast in her mouth and lands on her butt on his face. <laughs> or else it wouldn't be an accident at all. What did she say? My undies aren't cute, so I'm I'm glad you didn't see them. <laughs> what a kind, considerate soul. So, from what I understand, when her undies are cute, it's free real estate. She leaves without saying much, and he notices she dropped something. Which, from the looks of it, it looks like uncute underwear. The day is just getting started for our man here, because he finds himself pretty lucky on the train as well. For some reason, the train is completely empty, except for him and one other passenger. This passenger is a girl in some Chinese clothes who sit beside him, and then falls asleep on his shoulders. He tries to struggle out of her ironclad hold, but then he trips. She does too, and here we have it, hands-on opi, which he could have pulled away, but you just can't do that. I mean, they're right there. The train doors open in time for him to get out, after which he makes his way down a staircase. Are you freaking kidding me? Another one? <laughs> this is 100 miles an hour, man. This time, this time it's her crotch in his face, and ho oh, ho, mister... What do you have there? Why is your antenna so active? That was uninspired. That was uninspired. She's literally sitting on his face, calling him a pervert and acting as if her legs are too broken for her to stand up or at least kick him. Now, eventually she does stand up, but unfortunately, she's not really a fan of cable television, so she shows his antenna what's what. So everything that has been bringing this misfortune is thanks to a fortune teller's predicament that happened like in the first two minutes of the show. This means he has to avoid the cleaning robot next in order to dodge the good luck he's been having because the fortune teller mentioned a cleaning robot. He avoids it with much caution, but the robot then comes back with a woman's bra and leaves it right in his hands. <laughs> you do know that you can always not pick it up Right? Anyhow, the girl comes running and starts to blame him because sure, my man owns a cleaning robot as a pet and has trained it for snatching bras. That's something I need. The robot isn't playing though. He saw the girl as trash and pulled her away. Now that's good artificial intelligence. This wasn't enough though. He then sees a puppy, follows him to see if anything was wrong, and sees a full grown dog humping a girl from behind, or at least trying to do so. She asks for his help, but he decides to walk away only to have the dog try and hump him instead. This time she abandons him there and he passes out. Some kids wake him up and run away as if a literal zombie had risen from the dead. Now at this point, he is pretty late for his class and hurries back to school. His friend Ijuin Yoshio tells him he was gonna have a blast. When he gets to his seat, his nearby classmates are the same exact ladies that had a moment with him earlier in the morning. Of course they were. The girl from the train, Bai Mongfa, arrives in class and instantly calls him out as being a naughty boy. Poor phrasing. She tells him to face her, but he decides not to because that would expose him. The one with the cute underwear fetish, Izumisawa Aoi, tries to make small talk, but the man still doesn't want to look in their face. Bai keeps urging him to a point where he has to turn around and yeah, none of the girls had a positive reaction after seeing his face. He later tells Yoshio about all the accidents with a red face thanks to the countless slaps he had to eat. Back in the girls' locker room, Aoi is thinking maybe it wasn't his fault before feeling something missing. I can kind of tell, I already know what she's missing. I mean, you look at the way she's sitting in PE class. Asahi later finds a secret letter in his locker asking him to meet the person after school under a cherry tree. It's sad that the first thing my guy thinks that this is is a prank, dude. He bumps into Aoi again, who is soft-spoken this time, and he tries to ask her for, well, you know what? Without thinking, Asahi reaches out to his pocket and pulls out the bras instead of her undies. Why, why did he keep them? So the one girl who thought he was innocent is corrupted as well. He stumbles across Istel Kaden, the same girl who saw the rising of the spear hero. Seeing how she didn't have any snacks, he offers her some bananas from his pocket, which he also just keeps in there. She realizes that the thing popping out was a real banana. <laughs> Not a metaphorical one. Why did he have two bananas inside his pocket, though? Ihikin Ia is still being chased by the same dog. Frank, he must really be smelling something, man. He gets some bruises trying to save her, and Pai finds him in time for some treatment. She even apologizes for the misunderstanding in the morning. Finally, a rational person. Well, one rational action. Let's not get ahead of ourselves here. She ain't. No one here is rational. Irving Amelia enters the infirmary at the same time, and he gives her bra back to her. Just like that. <laughs> Despite the long day, he goes under the cherry tree anyway, and finds out it was Aoi who wrote the letter. And yeah, she confesses to the guy who took her panties, 
thinking it was a handkerchief. He can't believe his eyes. Mostly because her skirt is being lifted by the wind and he is seeing the sacred gates open right before him. He's had time to process the whole confession before meeting Ia again, who also confesses her love to him. Wow, so this is how we're doing things? Ugh. So he dragged himself to save her, which made her heart skip a beat. Lady, you were getting dogged on, literally. Anyone would have saved me. Before he can even react, Bai takes him away and starts to eat the man's neck, hiding from underlings who were trying to woo her, or so she says. Of course she confessed too. I'm not even gonna make it dramatic. Just before that, these two were technically student and teacher, and stop me if you've heard that before. Cotton takes the more direct approach, and instead of confessing, she chases him in a wedding dress, getting straight to the point. He slows her down, telling her that they have to stay their vows first. She closes her eyes, and poof, Asahi disappeared. I'd say Amelia is the only one who really thought this through. She's in a disguise asking for a person's signature. When Asahi tries to sign it, he sees an actual marriage paperwork. Like, you can't just freaking pop that on someone. He heads back home from a tiring day and sees that every single one of the girls is on the doorstep waiting to welcome him home. Lovren then reads a message sent by his father to him, where Papa Asahi tells the boy that all five of those girls had been sent there to be a potential bride for him. Tell me if this isn't a dad of the year move, y'all. He went to get milk and sent him back with a bunch of milk. <laughs> ah! <laughs> A bunch of milkers. Not only that, but all of them will be living together starting that day because that's a must. They immediately start doting on him and why the long face, man? You have one magic wand and endless possibilities here. You're like Timmy Turner. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Just shut up, just shut up. He commands them to leave. Let me guess, he fancies Yoshio more than anyone. That has to be it. They tell him that he has nowhere else to go and that if he send them away, they'd basically be homeless. Good. <laughs> Basically, it's what he says. His best argument is the fact that he's a guy and can't live under the same roof as women, and his mistake is operating under normal logic. I think his dad needs more time to know his son, understand his preferences, and maybe find what magazines he grew up reading. But they keep insisting, and he has to give in eventually. Living together with them does have its perks, as he gets to eat a lavish dinner, and he eats without having to move a finger, because all of them are in his face trying to shove chopsticks down his throat. Dude, even bathing isn't private anymore, because Amelia is inside the tub with a diver's mask peeking at his naked goods. He can sue you for that, you know. After a while, he gets fed up with the lack of privacy. Since he can't tell them to leave, he decides to leave the place himself. He decides to spend some time near the same cherry tree. Ow, he figures out where he was and starts to make some small talk. She talks about how they only knew his name, but were excited to see their potential groom. Excited about what kind of man he was going to turn out to be. Must have been a real downer, because he wanted to kick y'all out the moment he saw y'all. <laughs> she convinces him to come back just in time for him to prevent the other four who had passed and we're ready to leave from leaving. The cost of allowing them to live there is for them to tone down all the husband-wife drama. This is the agreement until Amelia grabs his toe and tries to use his toe print on marriage papers. That's not how it works, or is it? He talks about this morning's brother with Aoi, which I don't think he realizes is such a wife treatment he's giving her. She even has such a wifey reply. We do this all because we love you so much. How? How? You've literally known this guy for a week. This dude could be, this dude could be a freaking murderer. For all you know. The rest of the girls begin to wake up and everyone is disoriented, trying to find their stuff first thing in the morning. Asahi watches on as Aoi guides them all to what they should be doing and looking after. She is the main girl, and yeah, I can see it. Anyone can see that from a mile away. This harem is already a wrap. The winner is apparent. I want to say I don't understand how Asahi is not liking this life more than what he had two days ago, but I can I can also understand wanting to be alone 99% of your alone time. Man, that's how they're going to school, huh? Five women, well, four women and one dude trying to get into his seat. Oh yeah, I didn't mention one of them's a dude. <laughs> yeah, this this harem is actually pretty progressive. Cotton is very good with her Japanese and those kanjis and stuff, which are all probably the main reasons why these people have the hardest names in existence. Amelia would understand because she sucks at these, which is understandable. How is this man finding time to eat lunch with Yoshio? See, I was not wrong in my suspicion. Asahi is a man of his interests, and he doesn't see anything other than that. Yoshio brings out the topic of how cute Amelia was, which maybe if you like the feisty type, but I'm not a fan of spice. I'm allergic. Pretty sure she'd make a top notch soon today if the plot wasn't having them die for this dude. Asahi points out that her competitive nature is the complete opposite of her appearance, explaining how she figured out all the ways to win a rock, paper, scissors game just because she lost once. That's commitment. But she lost though. <laughs> 
You gotta respect the dedication, I guess. During his lovely lunch with Yoshio, he notices that he was eating his favorite lunch, which was made by Aoi, despite him never telling her about it. It's a usual evening at home with everyone trying to get a piece of Ozzy, but he is concerned to see that Amelia wasn't there. He heads up to her room and starts to listen to her making some pretty sus noises. Just to get this straight, he barges in yelling, what are you doing? Fully aware of what she could be doing, but decides to barge in anyway. Guess I was wrong about the whole Yoshio thing. Much to our disappointment, she was just trying to get the kanjis right, which must be pretty tiring. I mean, she started moaning out of nowhere. Also, she was reading a manga about bondage to learn about harder kanjis. Yeah, they definitely have some hard content there. Seeing her try so hard, he offers to help her after school, and here they are at the library. He arranges a bunch of tests for her and figures out that she can nail down the harder ones, but has no idea when it comes to simpler kanjis. The day of the kanji test is approaching as Asahi looks over her and recalls the hard work she put into learning how to ride sexual position. The test should surely be too easy for her after that. Despite this, Amelia makes it perfectly clear that she doesn't care about this, but just wants to learn his language. I mean, you can clearly speak it well, so I don't really see what your what your goal is here. What do you want to do? Do you want to text him in front of his face? Well, actually, yeah, yeah, people do that. The learning and teaching build a lot of frustration inside her, and Asahi heads to her room for some consolation. A free consultation. It doesn't take much to break her down as she begins to cry about how she wants to be able to write vanilla style and hide it under his bed sheets. He then gives her a little cheat sheet to help her practice the kanjis more easily. She takes it a bit too seriously and covers the whole house in kanji characters, even the toilet seat. The hard work pays off though, and she easily passes her test, even earning some praise from her teacher. I can't believe I've been talking endlessly about the Japanese alphabet without noticing. <laughs> The whole group is out on vacation thanks to the three of them winning a first prize lottery of two people, which would we do simple maths amounts to six and now my brain hurts. So here they are at Feather Fan Inn, ready to dip into the lust that consumes them when they see this kitty to rip off. The owner or the proprietress of the place is a giant humanoid pole with overgrown garlic as her hair. What is that thing? You know, also keep in mind that Asahi hasn't realized the fact that Ia is actually a girl, not a boy. So I lied to y'all earlier. What? He was, he was, they were, she was introduced as a boy, okay? I didn't know that. She's a reverse trap. When did that happen? Because of this, the room arrangement is done in a way where Asahi wants the only other dude to be his roommate. Oh, he's gonna have a rude awakening soon enough. My man just casually spanked her and laughed as if he would with his dudes. Someone tell him the truth already. The four other ladies then start playing ping pong as the two guys, quote unquote, act as referees and thoroughly enjoy the show. Especially the one Bai is putting on. She strikes the ball so hard that it somehow shreds all of Cotton's cloth and almost puts Asahi's manhood at risk. After dinner and chatter, the main event is finally here and Ia finds her herself in a bit of trouble since Asahi is already undressing, ready to take a dip with her in a hot spring. His naked body is just there for her to marvel at while being constantly spanked because he can't stop being friendly. What? <laughs> That's not a friend thing. Unless you're in sports. She then uses bandages to cover her chest and wraps a tengu mask with an eight inch long nose around her crotch. Compensating for something? Seeing this, Asahi immediately starts to wonder what he had been eating wrong because he is nothing compared to the heat Ia is packing. He can't stop staring at how utterly gifted and a wonderful specimen Ia is while she is constantly embarrassed by the fact that he won't stop staring. There's some times when Asahi comes close to suspecting something, but she just shoves her weapon right in front of his face, which quickly shuts him up out of insecurity. Inside the thermal spa, Asahi and Ia enjoy their merry time, but she is just there trying to withstand the heat and not faint. Fortunately for her, he mistakes her situation for resilience and is even more convinced that the ones close to a 10 is a man among men. This doesn't last long as her towel then flies off, revealing the Tengu mask in a lot more. Before Asahi comes in and spots her womanly features, which honestly isn't that bad of an outcome, he puts on the mask and tries to hide her identity. Somehow it works for like two seconds as they all freak out of the Tengu it appeared. But then she slips on a bar of soap and he realizes that what could have been 10 isn't even a zero. What do I mean by that? I mean, anyways, he does apologize to her after she wakes up, which was expected of him because the boy could not get his hands off her butt. She then tells him it was her father's dying wish for her to live as a boy, which explains the trapness. The episode then wraps up with Asahi giving her that be the real you speech, which if he applied to himself, he'd start wishing the girls he lived with in the house turned into guys. Pick up the story with Yoshio, who expresses his feelings about liking older women as he puts his virgin eyes on Bai. The episode focuses on Bai's life as an adult, comparing it to other girls and how they see her carefree adulthood. The only good part of being an adult is that you can drink, and I personally don't even do that. Other than that, everything is a disaster, and I see the anime understands it quite well as well. Wait, who is this albino dude in the 
white suit. I thought we were focusing on Bai here. Colonel Sanders surprises Asahi in his room and knocks him out. And when he wakes up, Asahi finds himself tied up in the kinkiest way imaginable. And I got an overactive imagination. I don't like where this is going. Sanders seems a little bit too big for Asahi to handle. Thankfully, he gets saved by Bai, who should have taken advantage here, honestly. She could blame it on booze and drink him dry, too. Wow. Man, I'm on fire. <laughs> They make their way out of what seems to be a hotel room. Of course, there are guards to stop them, but come on, they were never gonna stop a naked dude and a drunk woman. Since the elevator is jammed and the only way to get it running is from the control room, they decide not to take the stairs and literally climb down using a rope. Inside the control room, they're confronted by Sanders, who calls by by the name of Bloody Tiger, insinuating that he had waited a long time for this moment. According to him, Bai was once a mercenary who left rivers of blood spilling, a part of which was from Sanders' team. Hence the code name Bloody Tiger. I like how out of the blue they just try to insert these comically ridiculous bits of information that'll probably not affect the overall story at all. It's a pretty decent fight, but they manage to trap Sanders and make a run for it. She then opens up to him about her past life, telling him that it is all true until she got the offer to live with four other girls and try to woo a minor, which sounds certainly more interesting than killing. Also, still illegal. Both of them illegal. With this much said, Bai changes her suit, vows to protect him, and goes on to kill all the other guards in the way. She orders Asahi to run away and even shoot at him to get him going. Yeah, wait until his dad hears about that. You can kiss that paycheck goodbye. By the time she's out of the hotel, all the guards are done for. But she, but so is her emotional state, given how she went from being a school teacher hitting on minors to brutally slaying men like they were flies. Sanders returns with a Terminator cosplay, ready for round two. He corners her for a while, and after seeing how fine of a woman she is, he starts to get other ideas for revenge. Asahi then throws a fire extinguisher Adam of all things, which works somehow. Bullets did not affect him a couple of seconds ago, but sure, the fire extinguisher will do the job. Sanders tries to ragdoll him, but as he uses a bit of body lotion and electricity combined with a ton of plot armor to put him down. Bai and Azahi start to have a moment. I really want to say happy stuff here, but he's fake and covered in body lotion, so I don't know. I'm, I'm really weirded out. Another common day in the life of Azahi means he sees a random drone which had heat vision and was targeting his penis. I, I never thought I would say that sentence in my life. He gets saved by what seems to be a magical girl? Where's the show going? In school, everyone starts to panic as they see the same drone, but this time it is much larger. The report suggests that the drone is of extra terrestrial origin, which makes it sound fancy and scary, but all it does is target penises and fire a, a, a what, what is that, a lock? A metal diaper? Well, whatever it is, the drone seemed to fire at those at men's crotches. And you'd imagine it was so that the diaper thingy would stop them from having sex or using their penis, but no, it actually crackles up and then explodes. Yoshio was one of the first victims and Asahi firmly confirms that he had nothing after the explosion. No penis, no balls, and probably no butthole either since this guy feeds on radiation. It was all gone. Asahi then goes to the rooftop where Kari had just changed into a magical girl. Okay. Pretty much making it obvious that she was the one he saw the other night. She tells him there's no time to waste and asks him to touch her boobs. As weird as it gets, it gives her a surge of power, which leads me to believe her source of power is being horny. The background music starts to spike, and for a moment, it seems like Cotton would take out the UFO, but no, she does like one move, and that's it. She's done. Nothing changes. He then asks her how she became a magical girl. She tells him that a random floating rabbit came flying to her. She grabbed it, and that's all it took for her to become one. Okay. The rabbit is actually a sprite named Sagami Okamoto. What the frick is this? Sagami Okamoto Deluxe from another world, and the name of the world is contraception mention. You can't make the stuff up, ladies and gents. The UFOs are also from contraception and mention. Oh, the UFOs are also from contraception and mention. <laughs> the UFOs are also from this contraception mention. I kind of figured that out knowing the fact that they blitzed Yoshio's balls out of existence. But Sagami makes it official by calling them the ball takers. They're called the ball takers. The ball takers are on Earth for one goal only. I'll let you guess what that is. Yeah, it's to take as many balls as they can. The goal is to make sure not a single living male is capable of reproduction. The only way to put an end to this is to use Cotton's power to destroy the large BT controlling all the other BTs. Oh, I just realized that this anime has changed three genres in the span of three episodes. And right now, I'm recapping ridiculous hentai science fiction. 
addiction! Man, I miss the familiar. For Katan to reach her full potential, she needs to get a boost of TDL powers inside the MM unit truck. I am just as clueless about these terms as you are. At the very least, they give an explanation of what TDL is, and it is exactly what I said it was. Katan has to feel horny, courtesy of Asahi. They head inside the truck where Katan doesn't waste any time getting into business, and she starts to strip, dude. Asahi asks her if this was the source of her power and how she was holding up until now. And let's just say, Asahi's not the only one who knows what the scent of his balls are. <laughs> He understands what's at stake and tries to kiss her, but seeing how the love meter has no reaction, he tells her that her sense of love towards him is just not genuine. Godin doesn't care though, but she takes off one piece of clothing after another and is ready to make out a make a man out of Asahi before his balls disappear as well. Of course, Asahi was not about to get caught lacking. He's a teenage boy inside a room with a beautiful girl who wants it. Do you really think he was gonna give in? Even when turning her down, he somehow manages to find the correct phases to make her heart race. How is rejection making her heart race. She eventually mustered enough power to have a Pokemon evolution, and with that, she defeated the ball takers! Yes, my balls are saved! I I think there's someone delivering food to my house right now, and they might have heard that. Oh, yep, they definitely heard that. <laughs> Is it here yet? Is it here for real? Or is this anime messing with me? I see Yoshio with the equipment. Even the filter in the video has been brightened. It is here! The beach episode! And just so you know, we have five waifus and none of them are lacking. This is gonna be a treat, ladies and gents. It's not just any beach episode. They have a certain cabin and whatnot. We might be seeing a lot of action here, boys. Good thing November ended when it did. Man, what, what happened to my voice? Also, Yoshio was not able to make it after being hit by a car. That was supposed to escort them. Hmm, the swimsuits are a bit... Yeah, yeah, no, they aren't. I guess I'm judging too quickly. Let's just sit back and see where this one goes, okay? Still, I expected Bind to deliver, and here she is looking like she's about to give me a huge... You know what? We're gonna skip that line. <laughs> Remember what I said about swimsuits? Well, forget about it, because apparently this beach is a nudist beach! And the girls literally don't think for a second before bearing it all out. Rick, oh my... Bless this episode. Oh, bless me. <laughs> oh, man, bless every single one of y'all. Now, you'd think that Ozzy was having a treat here with how things were plan panning, but no, they make him wear a full face mask and have him cover his crotch. How is this fair? Also, what the frick is that mask? So y'all want this guy to marry you, but being seen naked is a no-go. Okay. They play all kinds of games where Ozzy is mostly receiving the short end of the stick. It was the case until Bai messed up and blew away his mask. And it is then Ozzy realized that maybe his father was not as bad as he thought he was. Of course he gets beaten to a pulp immediately after that, but momentarily he got a glimpse of paradise, and that's something my boy will never forget. They sure are foul to talk about having a ton of fun when it was literally five women abusing a guy to their heart's content. Nonetheless, it was fun and all, until all the girls just disappeared. No, that, that's it. They, they just disappeared. Also, he searches for them, but only finds Aoi, who asks him what girls he was talking about. Weirdly enough, Asahi forgets that he was even searching for anyone. Okay. What a tone shift. They then get on with the night as if they've been living inside the beach cabin for a million years. There's definitely something up with Aoi here because Yoshio just called Asahi's phone and she declined the call with a rather sinister look on her face. It was just declining the call at first, but after a couple of rings, she straight up stabs the thing and throws it away. Okay, what is happening? They enjoy a lavish dinner, but after this, with Asahi completely blind to the fact that a few hours ago, he had five ladies to woo, and now it's just one. She then takes him for a walk and brings him near a pink tree with luminous leaves. Similar to the time when she called him up in front of the cherry tree, Aoi confesses her love to him once again. She's rather insistent on him, just looking at her, but for some reason, Asahi is now aware of what has been happening and asks her where the others were. But there was simply no stopping Aoi, who had gone maniacal in her love. Just as she is about to give him quite possibly the first kiss of his entire life, he starts to speak the names of the other girls. Must have been like a gut punch for Aoi. Imagine you're about to kiss someone and they start taking the name of not one but five other people out of their mouths. After hearing this, she reverts to a younger version of herself and from the looks of it, Asahi is stuck inside a matrix. They don't care to elaborate on what that was about because the next day he wakes up in his room as if it was all a dream. Things are still weird he is surprised that no one bothered to wake him up. Except there's no one inside the house other than himself and this random woman. He goes to his class and yet again things are pretty weird. 
Someone else is in his seat. They don't recognize who he is, and they don't seem to recognize the names of any of the girls either. He starts to panic, which I would too when I realized I had like five wives in line a moment ago, and now I might as well have to die a virgin. He goes to a cherry tree, which is everything but pink, when a woman then confronts him and talks as if she knew what was going on with him. From the looks of it, she seems to be Yoshio, although I can't promise anything since I have absolutely no idea where the hell this plot is going. Her name is Yoshio Feynman, and she takes him to a research facility promising to answer most of his questions at least. In simple words, she explains to him that up until the time he woke up, he was living in a virtual world. All the girls that lived with him were AI, and he was probably having a boner in zeros and ones. He may have felt like he's lived with those girls for years, but it really has just been a literal day. So what she means to say is dude was part of an experiment to see just how good AI beings were with human emotions. Yoshio was just a model of the real Yoshio, who acted like his friend inside this virtual world while collecting data on how steamy the robots would feel with them. Everything was going well with the experiments until the beach episode, which I feel so stupid for enjoying because they were all just plastic anyways. Actually, not even plastic. They weren't even, they weren't even that. Also, thumbs up for making the beach episode actually plot relevant. Yoshio's junior, Ubukata, asks her why the test subject was there, and she replies that there is a possibility that the AI themselves instigated the selection of Asahi. Bro, it's freaking hilarious how the geeks are discussing everything they need about the project and Azahi looks like he's a borderline done with his life. Look at the man, dude. He wants to do anything but live. According to Yoshio, most of the AIs present today is a result of one mother AI named Ai. Ah, I see what you did there. Pretty crucial information if you ask me, but Azahi can't take a break from wanting to stop existing. This mother AI she talked about was created by the father of Asahi's childhood friend, Ai, who used the brain of his dying daughter. They might as well change the genre to psychological horror at this point, because it is then that Asahi realizes that his childhood friend, I, is dead. Holy frick, wasn't this supposed to be a harem romance show? What the frick happened? You never know what's gonna happen next in this anime. Because I'm pretty sure the creators themselves didn't even know that. Also, he seems to have finally come to terms with the fact that he has been playing romance with a literal bunch of computer programs. His eyes, though, man, he looks dead internally. Doesn't matter how okay he tries to look, he's freaking done for, man. On the other hand, the world is facing a bit of a problem because it seems that AI has started to take over all things digital. So that makes sense. Since Yoshi Yoshino is gone, the concerned parties are not very sure how to fix this problem, which sure seems very serious because they're sweating balls over here. Despite being fired, Yoshino is still pretty up to date with how much incompetency her former co-workers were showing, courtesy of Ubukata, who's basically a snitch. She then goes to visit Asahi. Why can't she leave this guy alone? And the reason for her visit is just as I expected. There are some problems that need fixing, and Asahi has to go back to the virtual world and fix them for him. Is this guy seriously crying over not being able to see lines of some ugly programming language? Yoshino then tells him that his childhood friend Aoi's consciousness had somehow found its way inside of the consciousness of I. So from what she explains, Cavendish, the main company, built a satellite named Muse 5 that had all of Ai's data stored in it. Aoi has basically taken over the satellite and is starting to run riots in the digital world. The only person who can access the system is Asahi because he managed to seduce the AI once, so we can do it again. Just when I thought it could not get any weirder, they turn up in his room through some weird rabbit clock he had and start communicating to him as holograms. They have this long, pointless conversation conversation, but the point is, and unfortunately, he must go inside the system, because that's the only way. Oh, shit. He still hasn't made a full decision, but the decision is made for him when Yoshino gets the news that Cavendish has begun to erase all of Muse 5's data. Even after an inspiring and desperate call from Yoshino, all he could do was avert his eyes. He sits in a corner and starts to remember the times he spent with Aoi, where they were very close. Not as close as Hadu and Sora, but you get the point. And so the obvious happens, and he decides to go with Yoshino. They head to the lab of Ai Izawa, which is supposed to be techie enough to support this whole operation. Yoshino types the lyrics of the Rick Roll song and they're ready to begin Operation Asahi once again, where he's going to try and convince an AI that he is madly in love, that is madly in love, to stop being human and start being itself. Wait a minute. Yoshino joins him inside the virtual world as Lovrin, and I still am yet to understand why they chose his design for this thing. It's so creepy. A butterfly made up of Sakata blossoms and guides him through the walls of protection, leading them inside the virtual world. As soon as they get there, Lovrin changes its form to Yoshio, who is still Yoshino, if you are losing track of what the hell is happening. This time, the world is full of robots and creatures hungry for some Asahi flesh. Yoshio also explains that if they are to get caught, they will be logged out immediately and there is no guarantee of coming back. The girls do come in time to save them, and instead of focusing on the more important matters on their hands, Yoshino decides to change form into Sod, yet another weird freaking bunny character that these people insist us upon. She then explains that there are a couple of different things to worry about. First is, of course, Aoi, or I, or AI, whatever you prefer to call here. They got 
to convince her to stop. Second, the eraser program is already on the move, and if they encounter it, they're toast. The focus is still on Aoi as they track down where she is, and she is literally in the center of the world, surrounded by walls and a bunch of protection. Although she's in the very center of the world, which is who knows how far, Aoi had taken the time to make a secret path meant for only Asahi and the girls. It turns out to be quite the secret path, because there is an army of goons there just waiting to stop Asahi from proceeding. I know Cotton and Bai were quite fracking epic, but every single girl starts to get some kind of superpower. Amelia literally goes Harry Potter, summoning a robe and a grimoire. During the whole chaos, Yoshino and Asahi get separated from the gang. This is where he takes the time to ask Yoshino if the girls were already hard-coded to like him, or from the very start, and why this is important again. Were you not on a mission, my guy? She agrees, but also clarifies that there were some altercations in their data as they became closer and closer to him. Bai overhears the conversation, but before she can say anything, they hear a cry from Irina. They rush over, only to see the eraser program had arrived, and it looks so silly, man. They tried so hard to make it look like an evil robot, but it ended up looking like a plastic toy model of a scorpion. This time, the eraser program grants the power of deletion to the goons, and Yoshino is the first victim as her avatar gets deleted as soon as one of the goons touches her. After a bit of fighting and running, they make their way past the goons, but the path is still not clear. Colonel Sanders has made his return, looking nastier than ever. He gives a whole speech about not letting them get past him, but by makes sure it only remains as a delusional speech. They find the gateway past the current area, but for some reason, Bai thought it would be a good idea to play hero. In what could have been an easy exit for all of them, had they not wasted their time talking about love, they start to waste time talking about love, and Bai sends Asahi off with a kiss and stays back to fight and die. Let me tell you again that all of them could have escaped, but she chose to play dumb here. Of course, she took down Sanders with her. Wouldn't make sense for that guy to survive for like the sixth time now. Yoshino is in the real world, trying hard to log into the game, but since her program itself had been deleted, it doesn't work. Ubukata joins her, and her mood lightens up for a second before seeing her on her screen that Mongfa buys data was also gone. All hope is not lost as she explains there was still something they could do. Inside the virtual world, Asahi is having a moment to himself, mourning the death of Bai. Cotton tries to act like she is indifferent to it, but starts to cry like a baby. I'm not gonna lie, it's kinda hitting me. They're surprised to see Asahi exert literally no emotion to what had just happened. He explains that they have no time to lose as they continue on their quest to reach the center of the world. Everything is going well until it isn't as they hit a dead end. The floor below them starts to vanish and yet again a bunch of butterflies start to guide the way. The guiding part doesn't really help because it brings them nowhere. All they see is a world with a city in shambles and some weird platform in the sky. The same sky is swarmed with drones full of the power of deletion. Godin realizes they won't be able to continue any further and someone has to act as a decoy to distract the drones. And yeah, someone else is dying. It was Godin at first, but shortly after, all the girls got the same idea and decided to be the decoy. Edina and Godin take the charge as they turn Super Saiyan and soar into the sky in full force. Good thing Amelia was not flooded with the unnecessary sense of heroism and decided to move further with Asahi. While he's with Amelia, Asahi begins to remember some of his childhood memories with Aoi when they saved a lost dog and returned him to his owner. Those were somehow part of Amelia's memory too, which she explains to be the trigger to her feelings of love towards him. They were having this super warm and romantic moment inside here, while Karen and Irina are absolutely rocked outside. They start to recall some of Aoi's memories, which were a part of them, and it's the same story that ultimately turns into the trigger of love for Asahi. As they recall their moment of bliss, another swarm of those endless drones just run right through them. So I'm guessing they're dead too. I honestly thought Amelia would make it, but no. For some reason, she cannot pass through the secret entrance and has to stay behind because it wouldn't make sense for her to not die. She starts to share the final feelings of Cotton and Irina through a device mostly about basically how much they had come to love him. All while the animators show a scene of Cotton getting brutalized while Irina watches in desperation. It's not long before Irina bites the dust as well. The glass on the rooftop then starts to break. The drones enter the place and Amelia sees him off with a kiss, preparing to meet her end as well. Holy frick, this is, this is depressing, man. So here we are, the final episode, and it starts with this guy just crying his eyes out, thinking how he went from an entire harem to being single again. He stands up and sees someone near the beach, and it's none other than Aoi. He asks her where Ai is, and she points to her chest before burying his face inside, which leads him to some of Ai's memories of the past. It's a memory of them from middle school, where they do what normal middle schoolers do most of the time, which is cringe. He just bought a necklace for her, and she asked to put it around her neck. The realism is unreal. It's not long before these pleasant memories turn unpleasant, as it seems Ai has some kind of a brain problem and doesn't have much time left to live. The doctor precisely says that she won't last until spring. Knowing all this, Ai still went on to make a promise to Asahi, telling him that she would once again watch Sakura Blossoms with him. He even made a little pinky promise. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely starting to feel bad for my man here. The closer spring gets, the worse her face starts to look, to the point where she just has to put on makeup to deceive Asahi into thinking that she was fine. The trees start to show some buds, and Ai is on her bed on severe 
life support. And I don't know why no one is around her right now. She's literally dying by the second. No one's bothered to just stand beside her. We get back to where Asahi and Aoi are and she points him to a door, letting him know that I was there waiting for him. He enters only to end up on small land, in the center of which is a luminous cherry tree. Below is I. They don't talk much as I get straight to the point, asking him to forget about her and move on with his life. I mean, he was doing plenty of that inside the simulated world until you decided to mess it up, but okay. He starts to talk about his pain and how it is impossible for him to forget her. In his brain, they were made for each other. Which I mean, who's gonna tell this guy that she doesn't exist anymore? His little confession of love is enough to break I and she starts to mumble about how she felt the same way. The moment she returns his feelings, the plane changes and becomes a replica of the tree they used to watch as kids. Asahi then leans in to kiss her. With this, Ice's consciousness is gone forever and she sends him off for the necklace he had bought for her all those years ago. He does some weird fusion stuff with the necklace as he brings it closer to Aoi. Successful in his mission, Asahi wakes up in the real world, greeted by Yoshino, whose smile indicates that the world is saved. In case you were wondering if there was really a happy ending here, then let me quell your qualms. There is one. Yoshino put in some effort, and with a little bit of hocus pocus magic, the AI girls are literally alive now, in some android bodies, and sent to Asahi's home so that he can research all he wants. What the hell is this show, man? <laughs> What the hell was the show? Like, you watch the first half of it compared to the last half, and it's just completely different. So, if y'all enjoyed, please let us know by hitting the like button. Hit the subscribe button to keep up to Mr. Recap content, along with the bell icon to stay super up to date. And, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for watching again. I love y'all, and I will see you on the next one. Peace!